In 1929, Albert Einstein, when asked if he believed in God, replied, I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the harmony of all that exists. What's up, seekers? Welcome back. Who was Spinoza's God? Was it a God that hears and answers prayers, heals the sick and comforts the mourning? Was it the God of millions or the God of the few? Was it the God of the Bible or the God of the philosophers? Was it a God that could be loved and love in return? Spinoza has been called the one who was drunk on God, and a profane and blasphemous atheist. Let's find out which of the two he was in this installment of Spinoza's God. This video is part of a epic collab with Philip Holm from the fantastic YouTube channel Let's Talk Religion, where Philip takes a whole host of incredibly complex religious thinkers and ideas, and brings his trademark academic, unbiased and understandable approach to each one, making them extremely approachable without watering anything down. With the hope of creating a space and community for real, open, thoughtful, and critical discussion about religion, in a way that leads to more tolerance and understanding of the other. Philip and I also recently had a two-hour discussion on comparative mysticism, trying to critically highlight some of the points of commonality among the mystical traditions of the world. Go check out that conversation and his amazing channel as soon as you're finished watching this video. Links to all of that will be posted in the description below. As part of this collaboration, Philip is making his own partner video to the one we're doing here, addressing the same question of Spinoza's God. Please do go check out that video on Philip's channel and the rest of his fantastic content. Links to all that down in the description. This video is also part of a mini-series on Spinoza. In the first video, we examine Spinoza's metaphysics, his view of what reality is fundamentally made up of, and how it fundamentally functions. If you haven't seen that video yet, and need a brush up on Spinoza's metaphysics, I recommend watching that video first, because we're going to be assuming that you already did for purposes of what we're about to cover in this video. But just in case you're being sneaky and skipping to the second video in the series, I will give you a very, very, very brief recap of Spinoza's metaphysics that we covered up until now. And for those that have been diligent and have already watched the first video, this will serve as a very handy and helpful recap. In Spinoza's magnum opus, The Ethics, he lays out in rigid and tedious Euclidean form the three fundamentals of his metaphysics. Substance, attributes, and modes. And I'm not going to do justice to them right now, because in the previous video, we spent close to a half an hour just giving the most barely adequate explanation of these terms. Having said that, substance, for Spinoza, is all that truly exists. It is the one infinite, eternal, and indivisible thing that constitutes reality. It's also what he refers to as God or nature, but more on that soon. The attributes, two of them, which we can experience and know, thought and extension, are the two most basic ways which substance can express itself, or rather, which we can come to perceive substance through, functioning similar to the two fundamental categories of matter and energy in modern physics, perhaps, or perhaps playing a mediating role like that of the tensurat between God as the infinite and the finite world as we know it in the metaphysics of Jewish mysticism in Kabbalah. In the first video, we expanded upon and pointed out the pros and cons of those two comparisons, check it out all over there. Spinoza's third category, the modes, are the final finite particular modifications and manifestations of reality, or more properly of substance. All the itty bitty things as we know them, tables, chairs, thoughts, emotions, all beautiful ripples and waves on the ocean of substance. Technically speaking, all the aforementioned things, those modes, are actually what Spinoza would call the finite modes, and he has another category called infinite modes, which are laws governing thought and extension, basically the laws of either psychology or logic, and the laws of physics and geometry. Check out video number one again for more on that distinction. At the bottom line, when all is said and done, perhaps the most important thing to know about Spinoza's metaphysics, for what is to follow, is that Spinoza was a substance monist which means that he believed that everything was fundamentally constituted by one substance. The relevance and implications of Spinoza's metaphysics to the question at hand of Spinoza's God will become very apparent very shortly, trust me. Okay, so far so good, I hope you're still with me. Spinoza in his own day was a controversial thinker to say the least, and his ideas were seen as dangerous by the religious establishments of his day. 
so dangerous as to warrant his excommunication at the age of 23, and even proving to be dangerous to Spinoza's life when attacked by a knife-wielding heretic yelling assailant on the steps of the synagogue no less. But in what we've discussed thus far, Spinoza has not proposed anything too controversial, and unless one was an orthodox Cartesian who was enraged about the fine tweaks that Spinoza worked on his predecessor's system, it's hard to see why anyone would want to assassinate or excommunicate this man with the gentlest of souls, our dear friend Baruch Spinoza. Where the trouble begins, and things begin to get exciting, is in the implications of Spinoza's metaphysics in redefining a very weighty three-letter word in the West, G-O-D, God. Let us begin, then, in this attempt to answer the question, what did God mean for Spinoza, with his own definition of God, in the words of Spinoza. By God, I understand a being absolutely infinite, i.e. a substance consisting of an infinity of attributes, of which each one expresses an eternal and infinite essence. Those of you who didn't watch the first video can thank me now for the recap. Thank you, Zavi. Oh, you're most welcome. So, Spinoza's major metaphysical concept, which grounds his whole system, his concept of substance, Spinoza says, is essentially another word for what we call God. The first 15 propositions of Spinoza's magnum opus, The Ethics, serves to rigorously prove to the reader the necessity of the existence of this thing which Spinoza calls God or substance. And the rigorous picture of this God which Spinoza presents to us is a God who is the infinite, necessary existing, self-caused, unique substance of the universe. This affinity, or rather identity, between God and substance is very, very real and important for Spinoza. To quote the man himself, God is one, that is, only one substance can be granted in the universe. Which means, as we shall see, that the only thing which really exists for him, for Spinoza, is God slash substance. This God for Spinoza is one in everything. Nothing exists outside of it. There is nothing but God. To quote Spinoza on this point, which he repeats emphatically in part one of his ethics, which he really, really wants the reader to understand and accept before moving on, all things which are are in God. Besides God, there can be no substance that is nothing in itself external to God. This is the first impression that we get from the words of the philosopher himself when we ask him, what is God? It is a God who is the sole substance of reality, in which all of existence has its being, infinite, eternal, and indivisible. He's beginning to sound like quite the mystic, I'd say. However, Unlike the typical mystic, Spinoza reasons and proves the existence of his god with what he believes is indisputable logic laid out in crisp geometric form, not relying on his experience of the infinite being of god, as many mystics do. By the way, I hope to present to you not just this one, but a collage of conceptions of the god of Spinoza, some even seemingly quite contradictory to the other, in the hope that when we look simultaneously through the many facets and faces of his god, we might glimpse the soft brilliance of the single elegant diamond which Spinoza painstakingly cut and polished, and maybe even delight and relish in its illumination, and perhaps see ourselves more clearly in its reflection for but a moment. Now, at this point it would be remiss of me as a Hasidic Jew not to point out the deep mystical affinity that this first understanding of Spinoza's god shares with another Jewish thinker, a near-contemporary of Spinoza, born just 20 years after his passing, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem, more commonly known as the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, the founder of the Hasidic movement, the most successful mass movement of Jewish mysticism in Jewish history, assisted no doubt by the fact that it was also the only mass movement of Jewish mysticism, who explicitly taught, Gott is alts und alts is Gott, all is God and God is all which has become such a popular concept now that you'll find it on bumper stickers on cars all over Israel, which read in Hebrew, Ein od milvado, there is nothing but God. Referring to Deuteronomy 4.35, as refracted through the lens of Hasidic metaphysics, where in Deuteronomy the words were taken to mean that there is no other gods but God. However, in Kabbalistic and Hasidic thought, the line means that there is nothing else at all in existence but God, which means that there are only two options for all things that seem to exist, either they're just an illusion and they don't really exist, or they really do exist and are God, 
or somewhere between the two. Such as the belief that insofar as they exist, or the existence that they have, is all from God. This is the radical revolutionary idea, which the Baal Shem Tov placed as the cornerstone of his magnificent edifice of Hasidic philosophy, with all his subsequent thought being built firmly upon it and flowing naturally from it, much like the Jewish thinker that preceded him by a few years, Baruch Spinoza. Regarding that crisp and indisputable logic we spoke of, here is the recipe Spinoza uses to prove that God, i.e. an infinite, eternal, indivisible being, is the only substance of the universe, in three simple steps. If this recipe proves too technical and goes over your head, don't worry, we'll be back to the main storyline in but a moment. And here it goes. First, establish that no two substances can share an attribute. Next, prove that there is a substance with an infinite amount of attributes. Finally, leave to simmer the conclusion that the existence of that infinite substance precludes the existence of any other substance. Because if there were to be a second substance, it would have to have some attributes, but since God has all the possible attributes already, then the attributes to be possessed by the second substance would be one of the attributes already possessed by the first substance, which Spinoza calls God. But since it has already been established that no two substances can share the same attributes, therefore there can be, besides God, no such second substance, QED. Now, for Spinoza, as for the Baal Shem Tov and many other mystical thinkers, if God is the only substance, and whatever is, is either a substance or in a substance, then everything else must be in God, which leads necessarily to Spinoza's conclusion, and I quote, whatever is, is in God, and nothing can be or be conceived without God. And individual things are nothing but modifications of the attributes of God or modes by which the attributes of God are expressed in a fixed and definite manner. Namely, all the particular finite things in existence that seem to exist apart from God are merely in fact modifications, modulations, and expressions of this one substance which alone exists, namely God. In this first depiction of God for Spinoza that we've presented, Spinoza took the construct of substance that he built up into the one and only single unified infinite self cause and efficiently self-sufficient entity, outside of which nothing does or can exist, and tells us that this thing, yes, this is God. This conception of God as substance, God as the all, is what gives rise to the most often association of Spinoza with the conception of God that of pantheism, derived from the Greek words pantheos, literally everything is God. Spinozism becomes synonymous with pantheism, and for good reason, because he's hands down the most respected defender of pantheism in modern philosophy, the first in the West to give it a comprehensive and rigorous philosophical exposition. His merit and originality consist, as George Henry Luce writes back in 1846, in the systematic exposition and development of that doctrine of pantheism, in his hands, for the first time, it assumes the aspect of a science. And it was his ethics which served as the fountain source of pantheism for all subsequent Western philosophy, to the extent that it practically became the textbook definition of the position, even though the term itself was only coined after his death, first used in Latin by Joseph Raphson, in 1697 in reference to Spinoza's work, and then popularized by John Tollard in 1705, who, like Raphson, uses the term pantheist and Spinozist interchangeably. That is aspect number one that I'd like to present. The next aspect of Spinoza's God that I'd like to bring to your attention is what is lacking in Spinoza's initial definition of God. Because equally important to what Spinoza is including in his definition of God, which is everything, ironically, is what he's also excluding. And we're going to look at four things which Spinoza explicitly excludes and expunges from his definition of God. Anthropomorphism, personality, transcendence, and creativity. All which will serve as points of departure for Spinoza's God from God as traditionally conceived among the Abrahamic faiths. The first, an anthropomorphic God, Spinoza clearly rejects, in his Scolium II Proposition 15, of the ethics where he writes, There are those who feign a god, like man, constituting of a body and mind, and subject to passions, but how far they wander from true knowledge of God is sufficiently established by what has already been demonstrated. 
Namely, any anthropomorphizing of God is by definition rejected by what Spinoza sees as his already established unassailable logic. Case closed. The second point of departure for Spinoza's God from God as traditionally conceived is God's lack of personality. I mean here personality not in the nice to talk to at a dinner party sense, but in the technical and theological sense, i.e. an entity with the capacity for volition, intention, agency, emotion, reason, morality, self-consciousness, communication, and kinship, one with which one can have a personal relationship with, as opposed to an impersonal or abstract force or principle such as the one, the all, the force, or the ground of being, such as substance for Spinoza, which is highly impersonal in this technical sense. The third and fourth point of departure for Spinoza's God from God as traditionally conceived is whereas God is typically seen as a transcendent creator who causes a world distinct from God's self to come into being by creating it typically out of nothing in a spontaneous act of free will which God could have just as easily chosen not to, Spinoza instead sees God as the imminent sustaining cause of all that exists, from whose existence the rest of existence necessarily follows. From the necessity of the divine nature, there must follow infinitely many things in infinitely many modes, writes Spinoza. Or, as he puts it elsewhere, from God all things have necessarily flowed, or have always followed, by the same necessity and in the same way as from the nature of a triangle it follows from eternity and to eternity that its three angles are equal to two right angles. In simple English, all things follow necessarily from the divine nature, as a triangle follows necessarily from three conjoined acute angles. There's no need for an intentional intervention for creation to happen, just as the triangle does not need to be created from the conjunction of its angles, once you put them there, by definition, what follows is the triangle. From the nature of God, what follows by definition is reality as we have it. And for this exact reason, Spinoza's universe need not be created by some entity external to it, because it has no beginning. It is, always was, existing necessarily and eternally, following definitionally from the divine nature itself. Before continuing with the divine, let us for a moment get a bit more specific about what precisely Spinoza means by nature. Spinoza employs two terms which as a set encapsulate the dual aspect of nature for him, natur naturans and natur naturata. These terms for Spinoza describe two different aspects at play in reality, all of which he calls nature with a capital N. There is natur naturans, nature naturing or productive nature, and there is natur naturata, natured nature, or produced nature. Let us quote Spinoza. By natur naturans we must understand what is in itself and is conceived through itself, or such attributes of substance as express an eternal and infinite essence, i.e. God. But by natura naturans I understand whatever follows from the necessity of God's nature, or from any of God's attributes, i.e. all of the modes of God's attributes insofar as they are considered as things which are in God, and can neither be nor be conceived without God. So, Natur Naturan Spinoza equates with God as substance and the attributes of substance, which express its essence, and Natur Naturata with the modes and multiplicity as flowing from the attributes, but always remaining within God, within nature. Which is why they're both called Natura, underlying their common ontological unity. For those familiar with the general metaphysics of philosophical mysticism, you can appreciate how naturally this maps onto the distinction made by so many a mystic of God or the One as emanator, and God manifesting as the many as the emanated. Natura naturans, emanator, natura naturata, emanated. This understanding of nature brings us to perhaps the most famous line in all of Spinoza's ethics, the one people are constantly posting with pretty backgrounds on their Instagram, you know what it is, three simple Latin words that succinctly encapsulate his metaphysics, Deo Siv Natura, God or Nature, his pithy way of saying that for him these words are interchangeable. Is it substance? Is it nature? Is it God? No, it is all three, because they mean the same thing for Spinoza. And this, according to the Spinoza scholar Stephen Nadler, is Spinoza's fundamental insight, and the fundamental principle of the ethics, 
To paraphrase him for a neat summary of what we've established thus far, for Spinoza, God is an eternal, indivisible, infinite, and uncaused substance. Outside of God there is nothing, and everything that exists is a part of God and is brought into being by and within God deterministically. This unified, unique, active, necessary being and cause of everything is what Spinoza means when he says God and is also nature. They are one and the same. But this daring and dangerous phrase, Deus sin natura, God or nature, in which this idea was encapsulated, which was so risque that it was edited out of the vernacular Dutch editions of the ethics that were published shortly after Spinoza's death, also has a built-in ambiguity. Does Spinoza intend with it to divinize nature or to naturalize God? And this, I think, is the central question of Spinoza's pantheism, his belief that everything is God. What does he mean when he says that everything is God? Pantheos. How does Spinoza's pantheism, with a God who is neither personal, transcendent, nor a creator, distinguish itself from plain and simple atheism? Does Spinoza's pantheism, his assertion that everything is God, really just amount to saying that nothing is God? Much like saying that everyone is special usually amounts to saying that no one is special. Typical pan-specialism. For all this talk of God, is he actually a believer, or is he a plain old atheist? And Spinoza has certainly been read throughout history in both ways. Both Spinoza's partisans and critics, writes Stephen Nadler, seem to have found it especially difficult to determine whether what Spinoza is offering is a devious atheism, with God reduced to nothing more than nature, or the most pious theism of Western philosophy, where God is to be found everywhere. And indeed, Spinoza was labeled an atheist even during his own lifetime. I met that atheist in Amsterdam, Spinoza, writes one acquaintance. And Spinoza's ethics upon its posthumous publication was censored by the state of Holland as a profane, atheistic, and blasphemous book. And his other work, The Theological Political Treatise, was denounced as the most dangerous book ever published. A godless document full of abominations which every reasonable person should find abhorrent, a book forged in hell by the devil himself, is what his critics had to say about it. To the extent that being accused of being a Spinozist back in the 17th and 18th century meant that you were being called an atheist. And I should add that that was not a great thing to be accused of if you cared much for your safety or your job security. And yet, on the other side of things, Novalis, the German romanticist poet, famously calls Spinoza der Gott vertrunkene Mann, the God-intoxicated man, the one who was drunk on God, the one who opens his magnum opus, his life's greatest work, with defining and proving the necessity of the existence of God to the exclusion of all else, and closes it by talking about divine love as the highest aim to which a person can aspire, a more die intellectualis, an intellectual love of God. Some atheist. I mean, with atheists like these, who needs theists, am I right? We can see now how Spinoza attracted both of these labels, but to really answer the question of what God means for Spinoza, I think we need to split the issue into two separate questions. Question number one is one of quality, namely, what characteristics does this entity called God possess for Spinoza? And number two is a question of attitude. What does Spinoza deem as the appropriate attitude and disposition in approaching this entity he calls God or nature? With the hope that that answer will shed some light on the nature of Spinoza's God based on how he wants us to be approaching it. So question number one, what is the quality of Spinoza's God? We already know the quantity of Spinoza's God, namely everything, that is abundantly clear, but what is the quality of his God? What kind of an entity exactly is this thing which is everything which he calls God? And finding out what Spinoza means by God qualitatively is critical, because, as we said, simply to say that God is everything, in the sense that God is synonymous with the totality of existence, may just amount to nothing more than saying everything is everything, which is a plain old useless tautology which is really the heart of Arthur Schopenhauer's critique of pantheism, when he says that to call the world God is to merely enrich our language with a superfluous synonym for the word world. And Spinoza's God examined qualitatively from the vantage point of question number one may very well fall victim to Schopenhauer's critique, because as we've already established, Spinoza's God, which has neither free will, nor purpose, nor intention, is something quite qualitatively different from the way that that word has been understood traditionally. 
As opposed to the anthropomorphic fatherly God that we find in the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Quran, who cares about his, yes, God is figured in the masculine, his handmade human, whom he often regrets making, with whom he enters into covenants, relationships, and with whom he reveals himself to and communicates with, threatening, chastising, and punishing them when they sin, rewarding, forgiving, and embracing them when they behave, and making plans and promises for their redemption, Spinoza's God, in contrast, seems cold and indifferent, antithetical to this classic depiction entirely. Spinoza, here in his metaphysics, is rejecting the God of classical theism, the idea of God as the creator of the universe, which God rules and watches over while remaining ontologically distinct from it. And from this perspective, I think it would stretch the English language to its breaking point to refer to both the God of Spinoza and the God of religion with the same word. Just to hammer this point home, although this should be quite clear by now, let me quote the historian of philosophy Frank Tilly. Spinoza expressly denies personality and consciousness to God. He has neither intelligence, feeling, nor will. He does not act according to purpose, but everything follows necessarily from his nature according to law. It really does seem like Spinoza in speaking of God means nothing at all like God as we know him, but is really just talking about nature or the universe at large using the word God. As Professor of Philosophy Blake Dutton writes, for Spinoza, God is no longer the transcendent creator of the universe who rules it via providence, but nature itself understood as an infinite, necessary, and fully deterministic system of which humans are a part. On these grounds, it's easy to see why Spinoza has been considered an atheist. As Beth Law, the Canadian philosopher and Spinoza scholar, has put it simply, Spinoza is an atheist in that he denies the god of theism, God as he is in the Bible. And on these grounds, he stands guilty as charged. And even while talking excessively about God, Spinoza seems to be no more than merely using the word as another way of referring to his abstract, infinite, and eternal construct, which he also freely calls substance or nature. Perhaps it is no more than a superfluous synonym for him, as Schopenhauer quipped, and in this case, doubly redundant. And on top of all that, as some have pointed out, Spinoza's assertion that the world is God may in fact be read to mean that the physical world is ultimately self-explanatory, that no cause external to the world, no transcendent being is required, i.e. there is no God. From this perspective, Spinoza's pantheism is just another way of ascribing to the attitude of contemporary science towards the material world, seeing the entire universe as one large, orderly system within which all phenomena, physical and psychical, past, present, and future, are causally interdependent in one large interconnected system, an intelligible and self-dependent cosmos. To call this deterministic, mechanical, scientific, or mathematical cosmos God is essentially to strip the word God of all its traditional significance and render it meaningless. As Copleston writes, simply put, if the cosmos is God, there is no God, and the person who declares that there is no God is an atheist, thus, if taken this way, Spinoza's pantheism is an atheistic system. But the final question to ask here, before considering this case closed and resolved, is what attitude does Spinoza recommend that we approach this entity he calls God or Nature? Professor Stephen Nadler, a leading expert on Spinoza, proposes that this question is central in determining the question of Spinoza's pantheism. And in answering it, Nadler takes the contrarian opinion that Spinoza's philosophy is so far from any attitude of worship, reverence, or awe that could be properly considered religious towards God or Nature, as would be appropriate towards the sacred, that we should stop calling Spinoza a pantheist at all, but simply an atheist. To quote Nadler, the key to discovering and experiencing God for Spinoza, writes Nadler, is philosophy and science, not religious awe and worshipful submission. The latter for Spinoza gives rise only to superstitious behavior and subservience to ecclesiastical authorities. The former leads to enlightenment, freedom, and true blessedness, i.e. peace of mind. But, to be fair to all sides of the debate, there are those who disagree with Nadler on what attitude Spinoza advocates as appropriate towards God or nature, towards his Deus Siv Natura. Another scholar, Frederick Copleston, argues that this perspective is not the only way the pantheism of Spinoza can be read, that beneath the logical schematism of his massive system with its definitions and axioms, its propositions and proofs, and its corollaries, there can be heard the cry for something more a hunger for the infinite. In Spinoza's very first philosophical work, Treatise on the Emendations of the Intellect, 
that Smirs began to write in his late twenties, but never completed, published only posthumously in the fragmentary state which he left it by his friends. In there, Spinoza writes about his spiritual quest, which led him to philosophy, his dissatisfaction with the things that people ordinarily strive for, wealth, fame, honor, and pleasure, all which he found to be vain and futile, and writes that it is only love for a thing eternal and infinite which is the source of real joy, and his hope that the pursuit of knowledge would lead him to this, to discover that which was truly worth pursuing, quote, the knowledge of the union that the mind has with the whole of nature. And this tendency and striving continues through his more mature work, where there's an attitude of reaching out beyond the transitory phenomena of experience reality to the infinite being which they are manifesting. Copleston makes the case that while for Spinoza, God was certainly not the personal creator God of Orthodox Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, God was to him that which was the ultimately real, the infinite possessing an infinity of attributes. And because of his ascription to God of an infinitude of attributes, unknown and unknowable to the finite human mind which we spoke about in the first video, Copleston entertains the possibility that this could have permitted a psychologically religious attitude towards the infinite substance, towards God, which Spinoza could have hardly adopted towards the mere world of appearances to the world of the modes. This distinction between God as the self-explanatory substance, the ultimate and the real, as opposed to the mere transitory, generated world of manifestations and modes, God as the ocean, the finite modes, the mere transient waves and ripples on the ocean surface, that have no existence on their own but are only realities insofar as they are the forms and expressions of the truly existing, changeless substance, allows Copleston to argue that Spinoza, although not conceiving of God as a person or a disembodied mind, cannot be called an atheist, because it is the world which undergoes the truer transformation and sublation in his ethics rather than God. And on similar grounds, a philosopher no less than Hegel himself writes, Spinozism might really just as well or even better have been termed a cosmism, the belief that there is no world, rather than atheism, the belief that there is no God, since according to its teaching, it is not to the world, finite existence, the universe, that reality and permanency are to be ascribed, but rather to God alone as the substantial. And therefore, in Copleston's estimation, insofar as Spinoza's mind was fixed on the infinitude of the substance, the phenomenal world could take on the appearance of comparative unreality. God was all. And accordingly, the attitude and feeling which Spinoza's pantheism demands towards God or nature is one which would fill one with admiration and wonder at the sight of the reign of laws and the majesty of the cosmos as an eternal, significant, and coherent system, in the words of Copleston. This competing response to the second question, the question of attitude, leaves us with a Spinoza who is hardly an atheist, but a pantheist in the truest sense of the world, where the only real thing that exists is God, and the world itself is illusory, and therefore, towards God, there can be a attitude of, of awe and perhaps even worship. And thankfully, I have no intention of adjudicating between these scholars who have given years of their lives trying to understand this great man. I will leave that to you, the listener, to explore the arguments and read Spinoza for yourself to see which reading appeals to you most. Enjoy. And just in case you thought this debate was merely a conceptual one for bored philosophers with too much time on their hands, I'll have you know that it actually had serious ramifications that played out in history with no less a consequence hanging on it than the very verdict of what the entire legacy and reputation of the European Enlightenment would be, and what outcome it would invite upon European society at large. The question of how to properly interpret Spinoza's pantheism became the central issue in a cultural war that engulfed 18th century Europe. You think I'm joking, right? In 1785, the German philosopher Frederick Jacobi published a condemnation of Spinoza's pantheism, after another influential German philosopher, writer, and leading Enlightenment figure, Gotthold Lessing, was alleged to have confessed on his deathbed to being a Spinozist which, remember, was the equivalent at that time of being called an atheist. Jacobi claimed that Spinoza's metaphysics amounted to nothing more than philosophical materialism. And Jacobi hoped that publicizing Lessing's deathbed confession 
would expose Lessing and the European Enlightenment as a whole as a movement that would ultimately end in plain and simple atheism. And in doing so, Jacobi intentionally placed his contemporary German-Jewish Enlightenment philosopher, Moses Mendelssohn, the German Plato, in a bind. If Mendelssohn rejected pantheism outright, he would be dishonoring the memory of Lessing, his recently deceased philosopher friend. But upholding Lessing's legacy after his confession had come to light would be tantamount to publicly embracing Spinoza's perceived atheism. Mendelssohn cleverly found a middle way to escape the bind by casting Spinoza in a different, more favorable light. Disagreeing with Jacobi, saying that his pantheism shed more characteristics in fact with theism than with atheism. And this heated debate between Jacobi and Mendelssohn, sparked by the death of Lessing, and which some claim even led to the early grief-stricken death of Mendelssohn at the age of 56, became a major point of contention in the intellectual and religious life of many in Europe at the time, known retrospectively as the Pantheismusstreit, or the Pantheism Controversy, eventually spilling over with accusations of pantheism slash atheism being labeled against many, including the great German philosophers Fichte and Schelling, and even causing the former to a forced resignation from his professorship. And as a consequence of this controversy, it became standard practice that up until the middle of the 18th century, it was de rigueur for every professor to prove their orthodoxy before taking office, and often demanded denouncing Spinoza as a heretic. Now, although Jacobi was hoping that his war against Spinoza's pantheism, which in his mind led directly to atheistic materialism and immorality, would inspire German culture to return to the safety of Christianity and to the certainty of revelation, back to the safe hands of God. To his dismay, it had quite the opposite effect, where young German thinkers and writers, who would go on to become enormously influential, the likes of Goethe, Herder, and Fichte, were inspired and said to appeal to Spinoza's pantheism as an alternative to what they saw as superstitious theism on the one hand, and a cold Newtonian mechanistic deism on the other, and in doing so turned, quote, the scapegoat of the intellectual establishment into its hero, and inaugurated pantheism as, quote, the unofficial religion of Germany. And in one way or another, nearly every philosopher who appeared on the scene post-Spinoza was influenced by this controversy and his pantheism in general. Leibniz, Schopenhauer, Hegel, Fichte, Schelling, Goethe, Herder, Novalis, Schleiermacher, Rousseau, Nietzsche, Russell, Wittgenstein, Coleridge, Freud, Marx, and Deleuze, on each of them and many more, Spinoza left his enduring mark. There's another debate here, which was spearheaded by Karl Jaspers, as to whether Spinoza was a pantheist or a panentheist, panentheism literally being the belief that all is God and in God, maintaining a room for divine transcendence in addition to divine immanence. And although practically there are many variations of panentheism, most seem to serve as a bridge between theism and pantheism, holding onto some aspects of either divine transcendence or personhood or both, while embracing some of the main aspects of pantheism, the immanence and omnipresence of God, it may be seen for that reason as something of a compromising position theologically. I don't want to get too far into the debate as to whether Spinoza was a pantheist or panentheist, because we've already discussed that in earlier videos, links to that below, but I'll give you a rough, quick sketch of it. In a now oft-cited letter to Henry Alderberg, a German theologian and natural philosopher, the guy who practically invented scientific peer review, Spinoza wrote, as to the view of certain people that identified God with nature, taken as a kind of mass or corporeal matter, they are quite mistaken. This letter has led to the speculation that although Spinoza believed that everything that exists is God, he did not hold the converse view that God is no more than the sum total of what exists. And there is validity to this assertion since, as we mentioned earlier, according to Spinoza, God slash substance has infinite attributes, of which we perceive only two, thought and extension. Hence, God's being and possibilities of being far exceed our given reality as we know it, and hence divine transcendence, hence panentheism effectively rejecting what some consider a crude reading of Spinoza's pantheism, which creates a false symmetry between God and the world of finite things, 
false precisely because for Spinoza, the relationship between substance and modes is indeed asymmetrical. This case was made most famously and persuasively by the German-Swiss psychiatrist turned existentialist philosopher Karl Jaspers, who argued that when Spinoza wrote Deus Siv Natura, God or Nature, he was referring specifically to Natur Naturans and not Natur Naturata. If you remember the distinction we made earlier between productive and produced nature, arguing that God is the dynamic nature in action, growing and changing, not a passive or static thing, writes Jaspers, which Spinoza called Natura Naturata. I hope you enjoyed that overview of Spinoza's pantheism. In case you'd like a recap, we began with a quick recap of Spinoza's metaphysics, which we covered in the first video of the series, his substance attributes and modes, and then we dove right into his definition of God, first God as substance, spoke about what this explicitly includes and excludes in this definition, we explained his distinction between natura naturans and natura naturata, and we tried dissecting what precisely is implied by Spinoza's pantheism, whether it is just atheism masquerading as something else, and looked at the two ways of answering that question, both a qualitative and a attitudinal approach, we had a look at the historical debate that shook the European intelligentsia in the wake of Spinoza's writings and ended by briefly presenting another debate, the third option for Spinoza, that of panentheism. In the next video in the series, God willing, we'll be getting to his more esoteric stuff about really seeing ourselves and all we encounter in nature as part of the infinite and how one may achieve that and what it may lead to. I'd like to present what I think is perhaps Spinoza's most powerful and beautiful idea. We'll talk about Spinoza's psychology, his position of free will, his proposed path to eudaimonia, human well-being, which he calls blessedness. In effect, we'll be looking at how Spinoza takes his enormous metaphysics and applies it to the very real questions of human suffering and flourishing. If you're looking forward to that video, please do subscribe and hit the bell notification so you know when it comes out. And as a reward for staying till the very end of the video, here is a poem and an accompanying reflection for you about Spinoza from Jorge Luis Borges, who called Spinoza his favorite historical character, whose invention of an infinite substance with infinite attributes he considered a superb fiction, and insisted that the ethics constitutes not a philosophical system, but a religious one, and that its author should be considered not a philosopher, but a prophet, or better yet, a saint. Check out, by the way, the original in Spanish if you're a purist about Borges because I played around with the English translation a little. The poem goes thusly. A golden haze, the west glows. Through the window, the careful manuscript. Awaits weighted down with the infinite. Someone is constructing God in the twilight. A man begets God. He is a Jew. With saddened eyes and olive skin. Time carries him along as a river carries a leaf on downward streams. It does not matter, the mage endures and fashions God with delicate geometry. From his weakness, out of nothing, he continues to build God with the word. To him, the most extraordinary love was granted, the love that has no hope of being loved in return. Marcelo Abadi notes that in this poem, Spinoza is depicted as attempting to carve his God and universe out of the coarse matter of language. But in the words of Abadi, the ethics may prove not to attain truth or the absolute, but it mirrors the gaze that seeks them, disdaining fame and riches. It is not God but Baruch who is constructed by the architecture of the ethics. The finest creation of the ethics was its very author. Catch you next time. Thank you for watching and keep seeking.